the agenda so i will uh, just uh, you know go to the uh, you know our speakers and i will welcome dr torsten zubavia who is the main speaker today our international speaker today and uh, to i mean dr zubavia is very well known and does not need any introduction but just you know as per the protocol he is the you know head of the department of dermatology and allergy chariot and current position is a spokesperson of comprehensive allergy center chariot uh, uh, university of berlin germany and uh, if we really see that uh, he is presented a lot of clinical papers in 2012 he has honorary doctorate of athens university he is a managing he has been a managing director of department of dermatology and allergy chariot berlin head of allergy center chariot and also the spokesperson of comprehensive allergy center chariot besides this he has membership and other you know he is a president of gallen uh, president of german academy of allergy and environmental medicine head of european center of allergy foundation honorary member of european academy of Aller allergology and clinical immunology honorary member of austrian society of dermatology there is lot of you know membership european society of dermatological research european academy of dermatology and immunology german society of dermatology is on the editorial board of uh, you know jddg also current opinion in allergy and clinical immunology and advisory board of allergo journal so welcome dr zubavia uh, in fact all indian doctors are uh, looking forward though you are not a new to indian doctors but still looking forward every time uh, to hear from you sir so we will uh, i will take this opportunity to introduce uh, dr kiran v godse who is the moderator for uh, to this webinar series he is a professor of dermatology and uh, department of dermatology dy patel hospital and school of medicine nayi mumbai dr godse has more than 105 publications six books and 12 chapter to his credit he is the immediate past president of you know the Uh, uh president of iadwl in fact and uh, he has been the national iadwl vice president 2013 and also coordinates for the arctic area sig so dr uh, kiran godse welcome sir for this meeting and uh, he is our moderator for the webinar we have amongst us a senior dermatologist and coordinator uh, from max super specialty hospital dr mukesh girdar who is Uh, from delhi he is a member of arctic area guideline committee and one of the author of consensus statement of arctic area dr mukesh girdar is recipient of Prof professor sardari lal memorial award and also he has <coughs> iadwl presidential award in dermacon in 2020 also he has award for professor k c kandari award for best resident at aims he has been awarded times healthcare award in category of legend in dermatology iadwl presidential appreciation award at dermacon pune he has been a vice president of iadwl 2018 president iadwl state branch 2015 he has contributed to uh, you know lot of books and on arctic area and dermophytosis and he has published papers and contributed in the various national and international uh, journals and also delivered talks in you know number of national and global uh, international uh, lectures then we have very senior uh, dr uh, v r janki from chennai she is a retired professor and head of Depart department dermatology madras medical college chennai she has been recognized as a member of national board for last 20 years recipient of dean's commendation certificate for cause of medical education and healthcare delivery she has been recipient of jc shroff award she has been recipient of iadwl lifetime achievement award during dermacon 2019 she is a convener and examiner of super uh, in the specialty of dermatology for pgs in most universities in south uh, you know india so among the various uh, you know she has given guest lectures at various centers in india and abroad such as as thambai oration k rajendran oration tv venkateshwaran memorial oration and has more than 100 publication both in national and international journal has more than 150 publication presentation to her credit she has contributed two chapters to iadwl textbook of dermatology a chapter in the recent advances in dermatology volume 
and she is a co-author for Handbook of Dermomycology and Color Atlas. So welcome, Doctor uh, Janki. And we have, uh, you know, see, the, he got an award recently for, uh, you know, the what we say, rising star. So he's a rising star uh, in India. And uh, Doctor Abhishek Day is uh, from Kolkata, a dermatologist and cosmetologist, associate professor, National Medical College, Calcutta. His uh, list of honors is Professor S K Panja Award in Excellence in Dermatology. As I said, Rising Star Award in World Congress of Dermatology in Vancouver, Vishnu Priya Devi Award from IJDBL, Best Article Award 2013, National Skin Center Observer Fellowship 2013, American AD Scholarship in Miami, International Society of Dermatology Mentorship Scholarship, National Award Dr. P N B N Banerjee Medal for the Best Original Research Paper, ILDS International. Scholarship South Korea. Again, Dr. Abhishek Day has authored more than 13 chapters in different textbook textbooks of dermatology, and uh, he is the member of much international societies like ISD, EADV, ACSI, and IADBL, and is the first convener of the Academy of Association of Cutaneous Surgeons of India. So I welcome all of you, uh, you know, and uh, to this meeting on where the agenda. Is basically, uh, you know, before you and the meeting on Arctic area, which will be uh, moderated by Dr. Kiran Godse. And with this, uh, before I hand over to Dr. Kiran Godse, I will. So, uh, there is a small video which I like to share. economic growth achieved is also witnessing the fastest growth in the healthcare sector which is why we established our presence and positioned ourselves as the partner of choice to bring important healthcare brands across the region Menorini Asia Pacific as part of a leading global biopharmaceutical company Menorini Asia Pacific's capabilities span the entire pharmaceutical development life cycle. A fully integrated biopharmaceutical company capable of research, development, manufacturing, regulatory affairs, and commercialization. Beyond end to end capabilities and cross functional expertise, Menorini Asia Pacific has also become the preferred partner for leading healthcare companies around the world. Our expertise in building healthcare brands, flexible business model, and dedicated alliance management to create value for our partners have enabled us to make strategic acquisitions and licensing arrangements, consequently taking many brands to greater heights. Our rapidly growing businesses are bolstered by over 3,300 sales, marketing and support professionals operating in 13 key markets. Our sales and marketing strategies, underpinned by local patient and physician insights, have helped many companies with varying needs tap into the Asia-Pacific growth story. Whether for new brands or line extensions, Pharmaceutical or biotechnology companies can gain rapid market access to the region and manage their risks by leveraging on our strengths as a gateway to Asia-Pacific. 
a reliable partner whose network and reach extends beyond the region with a strong Trek record offering unparalleled customer experience. Founded in 1886, the name Menorini has through the generations become synonymous with the mark of quality. A trusted biopharmaceutical company with a strong tradition in partnering, an established presence in over 100 countries with more than 16,000 employees, Menorini is bringing its illustrious heritage and compelling values to the next century. And here in Asia Pacific, our ongoing commitment is to deliver quality healthcare brands, invigorating lives across the region. Your partner, your brand, at your service. Manarini, Asia Pacific. So with this, uh, I will request Dr. Kiran Godse to take over the proceedings of this meeting forward. Over to you, sir. Yeah, Namaskar. Welcome to this uh, webinar on urticaria decoded, what, why, which, and each. So we are going to learn from the experts, global experts about urticaria. You know, urticaria affects 1% of the population. So India being a huge country of 135 crores, there is a huge load of urticaria patients. And we have only 10,000 dermatologists in India who practice. So as you can understand, there are a lot of patients we are going to see and we do see every day. And urticaria evolved for the last 10 years. We know the various causes. And the management guidelines are being changed every four years. And the architect of management guidelines is Dr. Torsten Zuberbeer. In fact, he is going to tell us about the management of urticaria, latest developments, and guidelines in a nutshell. These were formed in December 2020 and are yet to be published. But we'll listen from Dr. Torsten about the management of urticaria. And then we'll have a panel discussion on urticaria management tools and tricks. We'll take the audience questions also. So please send in your questions in the chat box. And then there will be a presentation of unique case study of difficult to urticaria by Dr. Vijay Day. So all in all, we'll get complete solution for urticaria management. And I'm sure this is going to be helpful for us because we have a global expert, Dr. Zuburba with us. Over to you, Dr. Tostan for the lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kiran. It's always a pleasure to work together with you. And of course, also a pleasure to work together with Menarini. We have done a lot of research projects in the past together. So I'm very glad to be here, although I'm not really there, but virtually I'm there. I will start my screen presentation and you should now be able to see the screen. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Starting, of course, with the disclaimer um, that um, is being mentioned by Minarini. And I may also say that uh, I personally, uh, I have a kind of bias in that way that I want to help our patients with really good drugs to have a better life in allergies. And um, so that's my, my personal bias. But going on with my title, now I just have to see it doesn't move. Management of urticaria, um, the latest developments. And I, I look forward to the discussion around. I know, Kira, you're going to moderate that. And um, it shall be a pleasure to, to, again, also learn from our Indian colleagues, novel ideas or novel possibilities and discuss them together. And um, we've just been discussing uh, life in Delhi. Uh, this is the city of Berlin with the charity in the, in the background and um, the German parliament in the front. But um, just a glimpse, it's a small town compared to Indian cities. But Carrier, however, is a worldwide problem. And I want to mention with these pictures some things. Number one, it can look, well, strangely, if you, if you look at the lower left picture, this could be insect stings if you did not know the history, swelling going away after a few hours. Angedema, often present in urticaria, and we need to remember that the definition of urticaria is 
wheels and edema or both. And there are cases with edema only, but they are histamine induced to the carrier. And this picture in the upper left is to explain there are patients with urticaria who have different subtypes. In this patient, we have spontaneous wheels and dermographism. So we need to be open-minded in looking at our patients and helping them. Now, another thing I always would like to mention and would like to be considered, and it's, it's like other dermatological diseases, psoriasis, we know um, atopic dermatitis, there is a systemic component and it's, I, that's what I explain to my patients. It's an upregulated, active, hyperactive immune system of the skin fighting, but more is there. And there are comorbidities. Um, so, so we do have comorbidities with allergic rhinitis, allergic asthma, other allergies, which are not necessarily, of course, the cause for urticaria, but they, they are present and Ideally, if we can treat two diseases like with an antisman, like with Bilastin, you can treat allergic rhinitis, you can treat itch, inotopic dermatitis, and of course, in urticaria, well, well, that's great. But let's move on. I want to give you a very short glimpse at the history of the guidelines. We've been doing them in Berlin, and, and I've been doing them myself um, since the year 2000. And uh, this is from the second status symposium in, in 2004, published in 2006. Non sedating second generation Andes means from the year 2000 on, it was always a message non sedating second generation Andes means should be used. And the message if symptoms are not controlled, increase. Then a lot of things have happened. So um, four years later, um, it got a bit more um, refined, the guidelines, again, four years later, um, a bit more refined, but it always stays the same message. In the beginning, use modern second generation antisense. And only then, as an add-on, if you look at the third line, it says add-on to second line, or malizumab or cyclosporin. And this has remained until now, we, this is the 2016 meeting published in 2018. Um, so again, only the order has changed. And in 2020, well, like everywhere, it was Corona time. We didn't have a big meeting like in 2016. We had an even bigger meeting, but virtual meeting. So very few people were present only. The majority, unfortunately, had to to join in like today in a virtual meeting, which is not so nice. But I want to give you a glimpse of the new guidelines. They have not been published yet. They are in the progress of being published. Currently, we receive the uh, comments of the reviewers, but um, the, uh, the, the societies worldwide have already acknowledged these guidelines. And the current one from 2016 meeting is still there, but there are some differences. There's no difference in the methodology. We have a voting procedure, which is very important because we want to capture the ideas of worldwide um, voting. And we did that this time again, but with an online voting tool. And only if there was an agreement above 75%, um, it would be accepted in the guideline. And we use the so-called grade methodology, which is, methodology which, is, which is important. Grade means you check for the evidence, but you also check for the upsides and downsides, risks and benefits. This means a drug can be very good, but maybe adverse events, um, very often there's a stroke. You wouldn't recommend that drug. Or another drug can be very good, but it's extremely expensive. And then, of course, in the grading, you would say first you use a cheaper alternative. And strong recommendation is we recommend and we suggest is a little bit weaker. Now, if you look at urticaria and, and look, uh, many people think it's an allergy. 
it's, it's not really the case. If it was an allergy um, to food, uh, we would, with a very short effect of an elimination diet, see that there is um, an effect. There is the possibility that pseudo-allergic reactions are present, and I would go into that a bit more in detail in the, in the background in the pathogenesis of urticaria. And I do that um, due to the fact that I have got feedback from many of my Indian friends where you have a country with beautiful, well, tasty fruits and tasty food and many spices. And apparently these um, ingredients, spices, can lead to urticaria. So there have been several 13 together open label studies with subsequent single blind location using these diets. And I can only encourage my friends in India um, to, to try to do another a uh, real, real clinical trial with these diets in the Indian setting. And um, the, well, um, the number of patients responding is, is very much different, but it only helps in chronic spontaneous urticaria. I want to point out that it's aromatic components in food which do these. And in fact, um, the, it, it's not the residue, it's not the protein, it's not the histamine in there. It's um, volatile aromatic compounds. And that's why I highlight that for India and these aromatic components of food, um, they are actually very small molecular weight. Now the question of course occurs, um, how, how could that be? How, um, where is the connection and um, how does it work? And what we did see is that the um, permeability of gut of the, of the stomach mainly, um, changes before diet and those responding, it's bad getting better after diet. And this brings me to a very important aspect in the diagnostics of urticaria, further that um, we should remember that there are changes in the gut, in the stomach, gastritis can cause indirectly the passage of allergens and pseudoallergens more easily. And we have also published that um, in, in people who have gastritis and helicobacter pylori as an infection, that in these cases, it only gets better, the urticaria, if also the gastritis is fully healed. So there is apparently also kind of inflammatory response, which has a neurological activation of mast cell mediator release. What I want to highlight here is, Actually, we've got a lot of unmet needs in the diagnostic of, of urticaria. And the current guidelines have progressed in the understanding of, of treatment, but little progress was made in the diagnostics and in the pathogenesis. And I would really, really like to encourage people all over the world, also in our urticaria networks from Galen, to, to look at that in their own community, in their own um, patient groups and um, really understanding the different subtypes and then of course, un understand what is the role of different effects. We do have of course also autoimmune urticaria which is uh, playing a big role in urticaria. But again, how, why and how is that triggered? We need to find out. Now, with that very short excursion into, into food and comorbidities, um, what does the guideline say? Um, the original guideline said, should routine diagnostic measures before performed in chronic inducible urticaria, for instance? No, um, because we do know a lot in the pathogenesis of chronic spontaneous urticaria. You should do something there, but not in the inducible urticaria. Regarding the time we have today, uh, I focus in this talk on the management. And however, I just don't want to give you just, just, just the gist of use this or that drug, but I want to give you an idea how to explain it to your patient. And this graph is key. It was originally um, mentioned and, and developed by my friend Walter Canonica, who is an immunologist in, in Italy, and showing an asthma, 
this minimal persistent inflammation, but it's the same in skin. In asthma, everybody knows it, that um, often mild irritation can cause asthma attacks again, because there is something under, under the surface. And for the skin, for the urticaria, it's absolutely the same issue. You have mast cells hyperactive in the skin and, and you just need a little bit of a trigger. It could be an infection, it could be an inflammation, it could be mechanical irritation in some patients and boom, it explodes again. This is relevant because you need to explain it to your patients. Many patients take their antihistamines on demand only. Not a good idea at all. This minimal persistent inflammation means we have to keep on treating. It's the same, by the way, in atopic dermatitis, in psoriasis. And it, you need to keep on treating even if the skin superficially looks good. And, and that's the second explanation. There is a very interesting thing about the histamine receptor. The histamine receptor is, is the one receptor in the body which is upregulated by the own ligand histamine. And we, we do know that from allergic rhinitis sufferers that in the end of the season in, in pollen allergic rhinitis, they have worse symptoms with less pollen flight, with less allergen challenge. And this is due to the fact that the histamine receptor gets more and more susceptible. Now, for the skin, it's absolutely the same. So I tell my patients, looking at mineral persistent inflammation and the histamine receptor, I tell these pathophysiological important issues to my patients, say, hey, patient, uh, I know many people want to take as little drugs as possible, but it's very important to know the drug, like Bilastin, it blocks the histamine receptor. It's simplified, of course, it's an adverse, um, uh, inverse agonist, but for the patient, it blocks the histamine receptor. So the histamine cannot um, link to it. It's, it's like a child protection in the socket. And remember, when the skin looks good from the surface, this, the next wheel is just about to explode beneath the surface. If you take these two things into account, please remember an antihistamine is like a child protection in a socket. It can only work if you put it there before the child plays with the socket. And this is relevant. So you need to have a consistent level of the antihistamine in the blood to be proactive for your disease. Now, of course, scientifically, it's a bit more complicated. And we do know that the mass cell has, has many triggers many ways to, to explode and it releases also much more than histamine only. And this is a graph depicted from my friend, Marcus Maurer. As I already said, histamine is the key, but histamine also is the key in comorbidities. And we should remember that talking to the patient. Now, looking at the recommendations, should we aim treatment at complete symptom control? Yes please. Well, the reason is, like I said, consistent, pers persistent, minimal inflammation, and um, it, it gives people hope, it gives them control over their lives, so please treat as good as possible. This is the old algorithm. So we have antihistamine, updosing, omalizumab, cyclosporine. Before, or maybe, maybe going back once, we also have the suggestion not to wait too long. If inadequate control after two to four weeks, step up. And we have this urticaria activity score of zero to three from wheels and each adding to a number on the right side, like day one, it's a six. And then you sum up for seven days, you have the UAS seven score for a week. This, however, is even better to look at if, if you're a doctor to take a month now, yes, it's four, two weeks depicted and have um, this flow. And maybe then you have triggers like important work projects, stressful or forgot medication. But if you give a treatment and um, you see the trend, like here with the carrier medication was given and, um, and it goes down 
the urticaria. So we have tools to look at the patient outcomes. Are second generation to be preferred? Yes, please. And first line treatment? Yes, please. And in 2020, same recommendation we recommend as first line treatment for all types, relevant for all types of urticaria. And why not first generation? I do know in India, you have a high use, especially pediatricians, first generation antihistamines. You have a high use of generics, um, often not of the same quality as the original drug, which is much more vigorously controlled. But why not the first generation? Well, the, the real reason is side effects. Okay, well, maybe some people don't have them. The real reason is everybody. It's not a side effect, it's obligatory because they pass the blood brain barrier, has a change of REM sleeping phases, and they are important for learning, they are important for concentration. And so it, if you then ask, well, now which one should I choose second generation? There are several on the market. Um, now, actually it's a kind of evolution. The first antihistamines developed were all first generation, all had these side effects. Why? Because they were so-called metabolites. Um, no, no, they were to be metabolized. The newer ones, like here, desloratadine, they are metabolites already. And then um, the, the, they don't pass the blood-brain barrier as much as the first generation. But there's a difference between these um, which are the newer ones, Desloratin, Levocetaracin, Rupatadin, and, and the youngest in this evolution, and the no, most novel is Bilastin, which was found in 2010. And they differ. So Bilastin is, is the newest development and has the highest receptor affinity. And also the lowest somnolence rates um, compared to Cytosine or Rupatadin, um, and this is key again. This slide it shows the blood brain barrier penetration. So, antihistamines like the old ones, hydroxyzine, atorax, or ketotifene, often recommended, they rush through the, into the brain and have all the negative side effects. But if you look, where, where is no penetration? It's up here. Bilastine is actively pumped. Out even. So, so there is really no, no way of getting into the brain. And this is uh, an important achievement. And, and therefore, not surprisingly, somnolence rates are equal to placebo. And um, some people, and that's also interesting, um, who've got hay fever, who are tired due to the histamine, due to the hay fever symptoms, they say they are much more awake taking bilastine instead of uh, taking other drugs. And um, it's also shown in real life, it doesn't impair driving. Well, I think um, not surprisingly, whereas hydroxyzine certainly does that. And especially in India, um, this can be re really dangerous if you do that. So now if you look at the question, what is an ideal antihistamine, choosing the right antihistamine, um, we wouldn't want to have any interactions with liver enzymes and we wouldn't have cardiac, cardiac safety concerns, especially also if you may updose. So um, again, here, um, this has been shown for Bilastin. Um, it's, it's perfectly safe in the liver environment and ECG data from many studies pooled um, even 11 times um, updosing or multiple dose um, updosing and have not shown anything. So um, actually um, the recommendation, the guidelines, which is of course not in the license, but it's the recommendation of the guidelines, updose and antihistamine up to fourfold, it's certainly um, guaranteed to be safe depending on the study results with even higher updosing. And this is actually the question, is increase um, recommended? Yes, also in 2000. 20 um, strong consensus and why. Now, already I, I showed you the picture. Um, it is useful um, at single dose to really block the, the histamine receptor, but there are 
are the effects and that's connected with the question should we combine different antecedents and there's a consensus against doing that why um, there is an old trial um, showing that up uh, combining different ones is not as good as updosing a single one but um, the real reason behind that is that modern antihistamines have an additional effect on cytokine release by mast cells. And we have done this study at Charity with um, Bilastin and uh, checked in, in a cold provocation model here in, in cold urticaria um, that we, we induced wheels and then we did a microdialysis of the skin and we checked the response. So first of all, the response is dose dependent excellence. So, so nearly everybody had a profited from Bilastin. But what I want to show out in the skin, in vivo, mast cell cytokines were blocked in a dose dependent fashion. And this explains that this updosing, which is not licensed, fully agreed, but useful and guidelines suggested, recommended, is, is, is really working because they block pro-inflammatory and this is the reason why you, you should choose one. And actually, for me, that's also the reason why people with hay fever for say, hey, they are more awake, more active on bilastine than um, with other ones. Now, um, updosing and transportaneous urticaria, there's also a trial, um, not only in cold urticaria, the effect is the same. We do have patients who need more than one tablet today. Should they be taken regularly or as needed? I explained the background, minimal persistent inflammation, antihistamines work on the histamine receptor. And um, actually there is agreement to that. And the reason again, minimal persistent inflammation. Now, of course, in, in the minutes left for me, um, what do we do if they are not sufficient in the treatment? Updosing is not good. So um, there is a, kind of slide for, for the asthma gene approach in a kind of reassess. And we've done the same looking at the old recommendation and the new ones. Um, it's, it's not the layout yet, but that's what you are going to see in the publication. We assess, we act, we adjust, we look always again at, at the treatment success. And then um, we go in a, in a um, let's say, amended fashion. For instance, cold urticaria need higher amounts in, in winter time than in summertime. It, chronic spontaneous urticaria also fluctuates. So the aim is to control, but we check again and again and, and potentially also updos. And that is also new, also recommended for omalizumab. We all know omalizumab is very expensive. It's an add-on therapy to antihistamines, but in some patients, the 300 milligram dose doesn't work. We have the data. Updosing works, especially in obese patients. Cyclosporin A, I definitely want to mention that. It's, it's not cheap. It's cheaper than omalizumab, and it, it works. We have a problem with leukotriene antagonists. Um, leukotriene antagonists have been recommended in the past, but we don't have good trials. And actually, I myself, had success with them only in those patients who have sinusitis. And then my, my personal interpretation is the sinusitis is an inflammation going on and the inflammation triggers the urticaria. So if you treat the inflammation, if you treat the sinusitis, then you'll get a better response for the urticaria. Other alternative treatments, a lot has been suggested. Um, I go through them quickly. The Depsone, um, is interesting immunoglobulins while well, there's strong evidence, but they are much too expensive and it doesn't really help. Um, UV light treatment, well, there have been trials, but um, it, you can't do that all life long. And actually, of course, you already have a lot of sunlight in India. Now, looking at these trials, Dexone, there are very few studies. A few, there are also from India um, showing it's, there is an improvement. And in my own experience, there is an improvement, especially in those patients who have long standing wheels, more than um, 12, 16 hours, not vasculitis, but nearly 
vasculitis. UV light, like I already said, it's, it's, it's been tested, but, but I don't think it's a clever idea to, to keep on using UV light. Um, intravenous immunoglobulins are too expensive. So we are left with methotrexate. Methotrexate is interesting. It's, it's cheap. We dermatologists, we know how to use it. Um, and there has been very, very few trials. Uh, one randomized controlled prospective trial. And I think this is something I know it's been used in India also, um, a, a drug which we should look at more, but we need we urgently need trials for that. Azathioprine, a bit more expensive, uh, immunosuppressive, um, not much data, you can't really um, judge on this existing study. But what we have is, is, is our unmet need in treatment. We do have possibilities to treat, we do have possibilities to aim at complete symptom control, but what we would like to know is much more about the causes and cure the disease, really cure it, find the cause, cure the cause, like immunotherapy in, in allergy, we should have something similar in urticaria. So to summarize and, and keep in time, we have to acknowledge urticaria is weird and angedema. There are people who have angedema only, histamine-induced angedema, this is urticaria. We have people who have wheels only, this is urticaria. We have people with wheels and angedema, this is urticaria, and everything is histamine-driven. If you have angedema alone, you have to rule out hereditary, you have to rule out um, the ACE inhibitor-induced angedema, but the majority it's histamine. And antihistamines work as well in wheels as in angedema. Antihistamines are the mainstay of treatment, simply because it's, it's a massive explosion of the mast cells releasing histamine, so we need an antihistamine. And we only should use those truly non-sedating, which really do not pass the blood-brain barrier. The message is treat long enough and high enough. Don't be too cautious. I personally rather start with four tablets a day, two times in the morning, two times in the evening, and then level down. But that's my personal, it's not the license. And remember histamine receptor upregulation, minimal persistent disease. And also for, for me personally, I think um, we should always also be careful um, if you, especially if you're up to us, to, to really make sure that you have good drugs and uh, for Bilastin, the original drug developed by Face Pharma and, and then um, in collaboration with Menarini, um, be, being on the market in, in many European countries worldwide, internationally used, and um, it, it is really something where, where I'm happy it's now available also in India. With that, actually, I, I summarize with, well, with the saying we always have, Kira knows my last slide very well already, for a better life with allergies. It's scaling the global allergy worldwide network. Um, our motto from charity and for the European Allergy Foundation. So thank you very much for listening. And, and um, Kiran, I give back to you. Yes, thank you, most, and that was excellent. In fact, we got a lot of inputs on the new management and newer guidelines. Uh, well, thank you for that. Uh, so friends, we are now have time for question answers and a panel discussion. The panel discussion, the title is Management Tools and Tricks. So we'll be focusing on the tools and tricks, what you use in your day-to-day -day practice to control the urticaria. We have with us Dr. V. R. Janki, a senior, a very senior actually consultant from Chennai. She has been associated with urticaria for many years. Uh, Dr. Janki, uh, uh, and Dr. Mukesh Gridhar, again, a senior consultant from Delhi. So we'll be sharing their uh, inputs. And again, Dr. Abhishek Day from Kolkata. Uh, so all uh, the panelists, uh, you can join us here. Uh, Dr. Torsten, uh, before we proceed, I just want to know, okay, what are the basic changes in the new guidelines as compared to old, like 2016 and to 2020? The two things which struck me was abdosing of omalizumab and investigations you advise about the more investigations so can you guide us what are your new guidelines 
tell us about the basic investigation in chronic urticaria. First, we know it was only CBC, ASR, and CRP. But now yeah. it is more. Um, actually, we have in, in the basic um, laboratory testing, we have included the testing for uh, TPO antibodies, so thyroid antibodies, because they can be relevant. On the other hand, it's an expensive test. And um, the question is how much change is seen in the treatment then? We do acknowledge that there is a kind of autoimmune background for urticaria. It's a kind of autoimmunity type one and two um, for IgE mediated reactions. There is IgE against FC epsilon receptor, auto IgE and, and others. But um, uh, the question is the, the therapy doesn't really change. It is good because then we know a cause and we can, can help the patient because many patients simply want to, to know and they want to have investigations. In addition, I think the, the major change in the guideline is, um, like you said, omalizumab updosing, but also that we don't go unidirectional, but have this circle reassess. And I like that very much from asthma treatment, um, up and down and, and reassess. And we should also be talking to the patient again. Like I said, um, ideally we want to find a cause. And very often in, in my patients, we have a mixture. We have a cause like a chronic inflammation, a chronic um, stomach problem, um, something where we can treat and, and at least um, make the urticaria much better, even if we cannot heal it out. And I think this is worthwhile reassessing the patient also. Right. So new guidelines, uh, we always know the basic investigation has been a CBC, ESR and CRP, but the new guidelines also suggest that you can do IgE and anti-TPO. Uh, these tests are a little costly, but well, most of the Indians can afford it uh, as it is done. So this will give us a rough estimate whether we are dealing with an autoimmune urticaria or an autoallergic urticaria. That is yeah, one thing. All... Yeah, yeah, Dostan. Sorry, Kiran, I didn't want to interrupt. Um, we also, of course, have discussed the autologous serum skin test. Um, it's, it's still there. It's possible, but it's time consuming and it's difficult. And um, normally, as, as a doctor, if you're not in, in science, we don't have enough time and staff uh, to, to centrifuge the blood and, and do this prick test, uh, the skin test in, in church. Um, cutaneous skin test. So uh, that's the reason why, why these other tests are then more practical. Right. So ASST is actually patient need to stop the antihistaminic, which is very difficult and uh, private practitioners in India find it difficult. So this via media is we can use uh, IgE and anti-TPO to tell us whether we are dealing with uh, autoimmune articular generally will have uh, anti-TPO test positive. And low IgE is also an indicator of autoimmune urticaria. So that will give you a rough estimate whether you are dealing with a truly autoimmune type or a uh, autoallergic type of urticaria. This is a thing uh, we, in fact, this is a new thing which we must do it in your day to day practice uh, for uh, the patients. Uh, yeah, uh, now we have got uh, the tools and tricks. Uh, Dr. Torson, what are the two things which you tell the, uh, we must use as a dermatologist? I think that UAS and UCT, this is the easily the two tools we can use in day-to-day -day practice. Yeah, I fully agree. And for me, um, the, where the, um, we didn't go into the UCT right now in this session, but UCT is a decaria control test. It captures retrospectively how the last four weeks were. Um, it's a good tool to see, um, give a first impression. For me, as a perspective tool, the UAS is perfect especially for me, the UAS 7 is not so important, it's just for clinical trials, but the, this sheet of paper, like I showed, um, then sometimes you have patient, it really feels good. There's two days with there is a spike where they suddenly get worsening. And then I'm curious what was happening on these days. And it could be stress, it could be having eaten something, it could be a drug being taken and, and therefore, I like to use this UAS prospectively. 
right? So the two tools you must use is UAS and UCT, which are easily available, which will give you assessment and which you can use in day-to-day -day practice. The tricks will come to know from our experts. Uh, so uh, Dr. Janki, in fact, Dr. Janki is one of the most senior dermatologists. Madam, what are your tricks to treat urticaria? Can you share us any of your tricks or what you use? Such a difficult question. Usual trick, no? Nowadays, I never, never start an uh, non sedating antihistamine of the past. I straight away go for non sedating uh, antihistamines. Uh, and uh, I am quite happy about it. Most of the time, I start with the two fold rather. Very rarely, I go up to three fold. And uh, I really take a, uh, I mean, give a good gap of six to eight weeks. Still, they don't respond only. I go to the next level. As uh, Zubarbeer has already pointed out, we, I mean, first uh, six, uh, four weeks, we don't do much test. But as you rightly said, uh, nowadays our weapon is uh, IgE level and anti-TPO, which is available in India. That helps us to know it is autoallergic. And some of the literature mentions, you know, even other simple tests like eosinophenia, basophenia, CRP, that is places where you can't do this anti-TPO titer, and this basophenia may help, eosinophenia may help, even CRP, even though it is not specific to certain extent, it may help. So my method of approach, a trick is as much as possible, I convince them no steroids. As much as possible, I convince them, even though it may take time, you stick to the schedule, I mean, it requires a little bit psychological counseling also. You stick to it twofold. If it doesn't work threefold, it is definitely going to help. Then two weeks later, down the line, when they come, then only I just think of next uh, level of treatment. At least four weeks I wait before I go to the next step. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Janki. So clearly, you start with double dose, you go to three or up to four dose also. Correct. That's a trick. And no steroid is important. Please don't start steroids straight away for chronic urticaria patients. And Dr. Mukesh, uh, what are your tricks in treating patients of urticaria? What is the one trick which you must tell to our fellow colleagues, which they can use it in day-to-day -day practice? Unmute me yourself, Dr. Mukesh, unmute. So before that, I, I, I wanted to make an observation. So we are three generation dermatologists sitting here in this panel discussion. <laughs> Dr. Janki, one year my senior, one generation my senior, and Abhishek, uh, almost one generation my junior. So that's beautiful that we all follow the guidelines, the way they have been drafted and the way they have been very scientifically and reasonably drafted. So I feel very happy, uh, you know, sharing the, uh, you know, the, a meeting with Dr. Janki here. Now, so far as tricks are concerned, uh, see, there are different molecules. Sometimes different molecules are for different purposes. Like for example, if you have uh, an SCID induced urticaria, area, you will try leuco you know, anti-leukotriene okay. agent. Like you have uh, a food induced urticaria area or asthma associated urticaria, area, you will be going for Monte Lucas kind of thing. Uh, the other thing is, uh, there, there is a uh, you know trend of dividing the dosages of antihistamines. So when we are dealing with a drug like uh, Belastine, which has a you know a duration of action of well over 24 hours, so if I have to give two tablets a day, I'll just give one one dose daily. So this is the other small thing uh, which I do in my practice, and I am very fearless in giving in the morning before breakfast because there is no sedation. So that's another thing. Uh, so it's evolving field, we keep learning every day. And uh, as Dr. Janki was mentioning for the poor man, basopenia, you know, maybe a very basic, uh, uh, you know, indicator for me that the patient may be having autoimmune urticaria. So um, there can be so many other things if, if when they are talked in a particular context, I can talk about it. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Okay. So obviously you have to find fearless to start the anti stomach straight away, you can start with two tablets. That's a good message. And Dr. Abhishek, uh, what are your tricks in treating urticaria? Something which you can tell to our uh, uh, our uh, uh, colleagues. 
uh, as uh, I uh, as Mukesh said, I was only suggesting, and other people also suggested. That I uh, try to stick to the guidelines as much as possible, uh, and most and most of the patients I get good results. That's what something I need to tell the regular delegate. So if there are ninety nine point nine percent chance if you stick to the guidelines, then you get best results out of our patients. Now there are a couple of things I need I need to say. I think it looks really. Um, really angry, really bad on the patients, it have a havoc on their uh, mind and psyche. So it's the first counseling, I, I need to spend some time with the patient, make him understand the disease uh, prognosis and the disease process and, and make them, you know, understand also the, it's, 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 it's very uh, suitable disease, if not cured, uh, cure, uh, curable disease. So that's something like counseling always helps. And then I emphasize on complete symptom control. There is a habit in India. Now they allow the, uh, they take it, uh, the medicine, even the GPs encourage that also. When the, the symptoms comes, you take one antihistamines. So I, I make the very fast counseling. I had to uh, make them aware that whatever they have done, they have to change it. They have to take it like a, a thyroxine or, you know, a thyroid medicines or blood uh, diabetes medicine. It's whatever you have, you have to take it as per schedule. So that's something I also tell. And also I make them understand only when we have complete symptom control and only when I can gradually decrease the doses, then we have the best possibility of a, having a long-term remission in these patients. And last one thing, which uh, is not often practiced in India, and I always encourage my junior colleagues to do that, that maintaining a UAS 7 score is not that difficult. Most of my patients can actually maintain US 7 score. This is uh, really helpful when the patient can see the, how their uh, US 7 score get uh, dropping every month and they feel confident in your treatment. So this is something uh, you can do for a better compliance from the patients. Yeah, right. So, well, all of you have told uh, the tricks. So I must tell my tricks. I say yes. that to all the doctors that you must give seven tablets before you say that patient is not responding to antihistamines. And what are they? They are the four tablets of antihistamines, your choice, two tablets of ranitidine, and one tablet of Montelukas in dose of allergic rhinitis. So these seven tablets you give and still patient says, doctor, I got high use. Then it's a time that you must go to second step. Although ranitidine and Montelukas are not mentioned in the guidelines, but many times we do recommend to our Indian patients because second line is little difficult, like cyclosporin and omarizumab. Uh, yeah. Most of the time, patients mm -hmm. uh, may not afford it. But well, this seven tablet works in many of the patients, almost That's 70 to 80 percent of patients. Know. It will work. Uh, that is our thing. Well, we have got a uh, few questions about the vaccination mm -hmm. and uh, COVID vaccination in Arctic area. Uh, Dr. Torson, there are some reports which claim that uh, those patients who have got extensive Arctic area or extensive allergic mm -hmm. or atopic dermatitis, Very these enough. patients can have uh, trouble with COVID vaccination or uh, anaphylaxis reaction. There are some reports. So what is your take? Those who have got extensive Arctic area or uncontrolled Arctic area, what is your advice? Well, actually, Kiran, uh, you, you know as well as I do, we are both members in the Galen Carrier Network, UCARE, and that we have gathered data from all around the world. So first message, people with urticaria are not subject to any higher risk of anaphylactic reactions. Second message is also um, they, they should be vaccinated, but people with urticaria can have an increase of urticaria symptoms shortly after vaccination. This is not an allergy. It's simply like in all urticaria patients, when you have a common flu, if you have just uh, even a, a bacterial infection of a tooth, there is a flare up of the urticaria as soon as the immune system is, is actually fired. And um, it, it really is due to the stimulation of the immune system, but the care symptoms worsen. So our advice is simply increase your antihistamine dosage um, during that time and, and know it, know that this is not a reason that you should not take the second vaccination because you, in most of these vaccines, you need two injections. Yeah, but I, I think that's, that's truly relevant um, to make people feel safe. Right, right. So basically, urticaria is not a contraindication for COVID vaccination. 
Only thing is obviously uncontrolled urticaria, please control the urticaria and then they can go for the vaccination or uncontrolled extensive uh, atopic dermatitis. Obviously you must control the disease and then go for vaccination. That is the thing. Uh, well, because obviously every day we get questions that can I take uh, vaccine? So please you all of them must take vaccine. Uh, that is uh, one thing. So because uh, the vaccination is one thing which is important for all of us and India is quite way ahead. And in fact, India is vaccinating every day one New Zealand, that one uh, small country they're vaccinating. So that's the speed with which we are vaccinating and hopefully we will come more of, of this. Uh, well, there are many questions coming out. Uh, this one question, Dr. Torsten, uh, he has told us clearly, Doctor, how do you grade bilastin and fexofenadine? Which is the one which is uh, the one which you prefer? Yeah, actually, quite a yeah, very interesting question. Also, the other question I, I've seen, can we go above fourfold in obese patients? And both are very interesting questions. Um, well, first of all, um, uh, fexofenadine is a non-sedating antihistamine as well as bilastine. And, and it's, uh, I would say, the second best regarding the penetration through the blood-brain barrier. And bilastine is, is uh, slightly better. It's slightly stronger than fexofenadine. Um, but both are valuable antihistamines in our portfolio. Now, interestingly, um, the, I, I showed this effect on the cytokines, and they have slightly different effects on cytokines, bilastine and fexofenadine. So you, you may come across an individual patient who's profiting more, um, but um, you could not say a, a prediction just from looking at the patient. So um, to be quite frank, uh, both are modern second generation antihistamines, um, but bilastine is slightly stronger. Bilastine is currently um, in head-to-head -head trials, it's the strongest antihistamine in the market. But the other question is, um, can we go above fourfold and increase uh, um, obese patients? Very interesting question. Um, it's never been investigated. We do know that um, bilastine has a plasma protein binding of 90%. So the um, it, most likely, the answer would be it wouldn't help in an obese patient to go above fourfold but we simply do not know, to be quite frank. In omalizumab, we do know that obese patients often need more than 300 milligrams per four weeks. Right, so well, 4-4 four, four is the dose. Don't go beyond that till uh, the studies convince us that more than 4-fold works, but otherwise 4-fold four, is the answer. Uh, we have a Dr. Dorsen in India, Bilastin, which was a generic, which was available since a year. And now we have got the original Bilastin available from Minarini. Uh, Dr. Mukesh, you must have tried both the original Bilastin and the generic one. What are your uh, observations? Dr. Yeah, so, <laughs> sorry for that. So, uh, Difficult to make any definite uh, observation on this, but uh, I would say when I've used this uh, Menarini Belastine, it hasn't failed me. So at the, you know, you have not shifted any patient from one brand to the other brand. So it will be very, very difficult to make a very strong passing remark uh, on, on this. But as I always believe that the originator brands are always, you know, they are more sure of themselves. They are more concerned about their efficacy and purity and everything. So I will always prefer to use the originator brand rather than a generic brand. Yeah, that's right. In fact, if you can afford Mercedes, don't go for any other car. So the best brand is available with us in India. Uh, that is from Bilash and from Menarini. So you can always use this brand and see the difference. Uh, Dr. Abhishek, uh, you did a study on uh, real-time st uh, study on the bilastin, uh, which you got published also. So can you give us the uh, salient features of that study? Yes, sir. Uh, it is about 50 patients who have included in bilastin. This people was already being treated with at least the standard dose or double dose of antihistamine, other antihistamine, including levocetogen, fexofenadine, and do you shift it to double dose of uh, bilastin uh, straight away? And uh, some of the patients, we need to elevate the doses. So out of the 50 
at least 36 patients got excellent uh, sorry 46 patient get got excellent response with biolestin either two fold or three fold or four fold doses uh, over six months so we uh, we actually noted the us7 score we noted the uh, quality of life so everything uh, was quite improved and quite um, uh, i would say quite impressive uh, Four portion, however, required uh, omalizumab or cyclosporine. That is always possible in uh, articaria. Right. So, bilastin has shown efficacy in Indian patients. Uh, and obviously, we know that uh, bilastin, in fact, Torsten, I just heard that bilastin got the perfect 10 score in the area guidelines. What is this perfect 10 or what does it indicate? Uh, actually, I, I don't know the perfect 10. We have the ideal antihistamine, if you mean that. Yeah. Um, okay, yes. Um, uh, actually, that's from the ARIA uh, originating from Jean Bousquet, that um, it, it, it should be having no side effects, no interactions with um, cytochrome P450, um, rapid um, uh, action, and um, no sedation. And all that is covered by, by Bilastin. I wanted to make one remark, Kieran, if I may, um, regarding the discussion of the generics. I don't know if everybody in the audience knows the definition, the legal definition. A generic has to show not efficacy in a clinical trial, only the pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics are checked. That means the uptake, uh, the bioavailability, is checked and the generic has to be at least 80% or up to 125% bioavailability. Now, you may say this is not relevant, but if you tell your um, government, I think I should only pay 80% taxes next year, they would say, hey, this is relevant. Um, now, <laughs> you wonder, wonder why um, governments make this so easy for generics to be produced. And you could say, well, in single dose, well, 80%, 10%, there is a difference. But if you now updose and you use a generic and suddenly you only have four times 80, 320 instead of um, 400 milligrams uh, activity, let's say like that, or percent activity, uh, there is a big difference. So um, this is one thing which I think is simply not fair by governments worldwide to have generics uncontrolled. They should also have clinical trials to prove efficacy. And, and like Mukesh correctly said, there are different brands and you never know which is um, well controlled or not. And with the original, you simply know you don't have any copy. Yeah, right. So important is to use the best brand available to give the best result to the patients because patient is important. He must give a complete relief. And the difference between the originator and the generic is not much. So obviously, the originator is always preferred. Uh, Dr. Janki, you have been practicing more than 30, 40 years. Uh, you've got the longest experience with all of us. Uh, so I just want to know, when an articular patient comes to you, a chronic articular patient, uh, what is your approach? What you tell that patient? Apart from investigation, you already told us. But uh, what else you tell the patient? I mean, uh, regarding how to approach it. Yeah. I mean, uh, more as uh, Abhishek uh, said, the counseling, counseling is very important. We tell them to be patient. But at the same time, there are so many factors. Uh, young college students come, geriatric patient come, office goers come. So depending upon the individual, we have to, uh, I mean, we have to change our uh, strategy. Sometimes, no. Uh, young college students who desperately want something, we definitely go to the next level. Whereas geriatric patients where they can pr prefer to wait for some time, we convince them uh, two doses more than enough. If at all, you take a third dose in the afternoon and try to manage. And most of the time, I am uh, talking is more important. And uh, investigations, as you rightly said, no. even if we sometimes feel they don't need the patient desperately needs it. At which point of time, for their sake, I do some investigations. And regarding going to the next step, as Dr. Zuberbier mentioned, uh, in, I mean, I have not used to omeluzumab at all. I am quite happy with cyclosporine per acute tiding over. 
as the patient is on cyclosporine, I simultaneously start them on methotrexate. I have some 20, 30 patients who are doing very well with methotrexate, uh, very well. One uh, income tax commissioner, he suffered nearly for two years. I thought that, and finally, with great hesitancy, I put him on methotrexate 10 milligram. Remarkably, he did very well and his urticaria never came back. That is, individual variations are there. So my choice, as much as possible, uh, try to manage only with non-sedating antihistamine. Convince them, convince them. Sometimes uh, we say no steroids, but as you are rightly said, my 40 years of experience, some sudden crisis, examination, marriage, uh, some uh, critical situations, when we desperately want to do something, we do give a short course of steroid and withdraw. Even though academically we say no steroids and most of the time I also never use, but I do use steroids when we definitely need it, a short spell and withdraw. So first option, only non-sedating, counseling. Second option, cyclosporine and methotrexate. Dapsone, of course, I have never tried Colchicin, I have tried in a couple of patients when there is a, a suspect some associated infection or associated autoimmune, which has definitely helped. Sar put a very good, a good slide regarding Dapsone. He said, uh, excellent response. Somehow, psychologically, we are a little bit afraid of Dapsone. That is why it is preventing us from using. Otherwise, it's a good drug. So instead of Dapsone, I prefer uh, Colchicin. See, this is why I approach. I, with all these things, some of the chronic urticaria, nearly 10% of the patients do come and ask, why don't you do something? Thank you. Thank you, madam, for your wise words of wisdom and uh, the thing. Obviously, the Dapsone, uh, well, Colchicin could be used for vascular disease. Dr. Abhishek, you would like to add something? Yeah. Uh, sir, I just want to have a question to you people. Uh, now that we know that there's two distinct groups among chronic spontaneous urticaria, one people who are more autoallergic, type 1A, type 1, and another is type 2B, autoimmune. So if we can do those, uh, if we can do those tests uh, to know which one uh, is type 2B, and should we start directly cyclosporine on those patients who are type 2B? Uh, I mean, we suspect that to be type 2B, or we should give omalazumab, wait for it, it's not working, updose it, and then go for cyclosporine. Uh, Abhishek, can I answer the question? Actually, yeah. type 1, when you do the IgE level and anti-thyroid, that is TPO level, there omeluzumab works much better. Uh, where you have associated other uh, uh, atopic diathesis. Whereas, as you rightly mentioned, type 2B, where it is mostly associated with other autoimmune diseases, in those cases, cyclosporine methotrexate, in other words, immunosuppressive will be a good option. So, omeluzumab only for type 1, whereas type 2B, we prefer immunosuppressive. I mean, uh, recently, yes, in 2021, uh, nice article has come with uh, a yes, tabular column. Yes, yes, uh, yes, yes, yes ma'am. Yeah, Dr. Tarstan, uh, what is your take? Should we straight away go ahead with uh, cyclosporine for this? Because guidelines say that you use omeluzumab in all the patients, irrespective of whether they are Oh, um, uh, Kiran, thank you for the question. I do, of course, um, see the idea behind what uh, Dr. Abhishek just, just um, explained. The guideline is pretty clear. Um, go for omalizumab first. And the reason is, among others, also omalizumab is licensed for urticaria. It's a legal reason, whereas Cyclosporin A is not. In many areas of the world, like in my country, in Germany, um, in case a patient got this adverse event on cyclosporin A, which could be even, even a, a serious adverse events with kidney yeah, um, or liver problems, um, we would be liable as a doctor if we did not use omalizumab first before we did that. And <laughs> I think there are some problems somewhere in the background. Uh, Janki um, has a problem. So, Janki, you, can, uh, you are still visible. Don't worry. You continue. And um, so um, th that is my reason why in the guidelines, we simply say, um, yes, um, we start with Omar Tzuma. But I think it's, it's valuable to have these scientific discussions because we do have patients who do not We have patients who beautifully, quickly respond on Omar Tzuma and others, slow responders. But, but, for me, 
apparently, um, although the theoretic discussions are there, in real life, nearly everybody responds to omalizumab, independent of the background of the autoimmune um, disease. So um, I think I would stick to the guideline here until we would have really more evidence, although I like this line of thinking. Um, actually, this is interesting. We also have this question in, in the chat, um, what other tests do you do and for autoimmune spontaneous um, urticaria? And, uh, and this is a bit disappointing. Um, of course, we, we know from, from background research, we have these autoimmune type um, 1 and 2 and 2 A and B and, and other um, re real pathophysiological, pathophysiological distinctions. Um, we have checked for IgE against different um, cytokines also. But the problem is none of these more refined tests are available in clinical routine. The same holds true. Um, there is a nice test with sugar solutions to test for changes in the gastric mucosa permeability. It's a very interesting, it's a predictor for um, that, that the um, diet would work, but it's not commercially available. So uh, in fact, the answer to that question, what do we do, um, it's, it's disappointing. We do very little. We do try and error in treatment. We can do the crown, the autologous serum skin test. I do not do it on a routine uh, because we simply don't have the capacity. And it doesn't explain really what, what really the pathophysiological background is. And it's not correlated to treatment success. We've done that in the past long series. Um, so we have several patients also who are autologous serum skin test positive although the urticaria has ceased and um, has, has actually stopped being there, but this test is positive. So for me, um, the predictive value is, is very low. So uh, unfortunately, um, this question is, is disappointing. Well, uh, the questions will come, man, I uh, Yeah, There's one more question from the role of mast cell stabilizers uh, in urticaria. Dr. Russian, do you still use the ketotifane? Uh, I, I can tell you it's very easy. Um, the mast cell stabilizer chromoglycate is not resorbed from the gut. So it's a valuable drug in mast cell cytosis with gastrointestinal involvement. It's not most likely not valuable in urticaria because it's not resorbed. However, um, what we have not looked at is the gut. And um, we have new trials in allergic rhinitis with the microbiome of the um, gut and could show that with changes in the microbiome, um, activity of allergic rhinitis and double blind placebo control testing is associated. And this is something which we have not looked yet at um, profoundly in urticaria. So um, it's always good to be open-minded, but currently um, I have never seen that chromoglycate would help in urticaria. Right, uh, there are a few more questions. Uh, Dr. Mukesh, uh, uh, how often you review your chronic urticaria patients? You know, how long, how often you call them and how often you titrate the dose? Okay, so um, when the patient of chronic urticaria comes to me, uh, first of all, I have to tell the patient that I'm going to put you on a class of medicines, which are second generation antihistamines, which are safe to use. And I tell them that even if you have to use them for 10 years, 20 years, they are not going to cause any harm to you. So don't be hesitant to take them. Now take as much as you need, actually. So I will start them on one dose only if it's a naive patient, but most of my patients have already taken treatment for urticaria somewhere. So my starting dose is double the dose or four times the dose. So once I start the patient on antihistamine, normally I will like to come uh, call the patient after two weeks to see how the patient has responded. If the patient has come from far off place, I will tell the patient that if you are controlled on this much of dose, come back after three months. There is no need to come before that. Now, once the patient comes on the second visit, see, counseling of the patient is an online, on, ongoing process actually. You have to prepare him for the long haul. Patient is, the next question automatically comes is, okay, well, I'm controlled for how long to take the medicine. So then I tell the patient that, well, 
we give them some statistics also that this many patients resolve in six months, one year, this many resolve in three to five years. And so many people keep having it beyond five years also. We don't know what is going to happen in your case, but in any case, you are on a harmless medication. So keep taking it. Maybe you come after three months. So normally I will call the patients every three months. And once I see that the urticaria is absolutely controlled, absolutely U zero US, then I will you know, think of reducing the dose. And then reduction of the dose is also by one tablet at a time not faster reduction. So every month or two months, they can reduce one tablet and see what happens. Yeah, right. So gradual reduction is a key. So that is what uh, the new guidelines when will come, you will see that uh, circle with uh, reassess. Uh, the same. Dr. Torshan, can you just tell us about that circle and how that is from uh, what you are, what will be getting in the new guidelines? Uh, they are very uh, catchy to understand. So just give us the glimpses of that uh, circle which you just posted, you just showed us on our PowerPoint. The circle, you mean uh, uh, act, assess, readjust. Yeah, act, um, assess, and reassess. I, I, I think um, the most important message here is uh, to, to stimulate colleagues to listen more carefully to our patients and um, not, not just send them away on medication and then um, maybe see them again in six months. Um, and uh, also remember that the same procedure could be used for different subtypes. We have patients who have two diseases. They have prior spontaneous urticaria, they have cold urticaria. So in winter, they would need a different medication compared to summer. And, and this is actually um, incorporated in this circle that uh, it's always important to, to think again and talk to the patient. Um, I feel personally that I often have discovered very interesting triggering factors, but just meeting again the patient and then listening to the patient, looking at this, what we discussed, the UAS score for a month, say, hey, what happened there? Well, there was a funny, funny incident. I once checked uh, with the Russian colleagues. It was always visiting the mother-in-law um, when urticaria got worse. And uh, this could be stress because mother-in-laws can be stressful. But uh, in that case, it was that this mother-in-law used aspirin to preserve um, the canned food. And um, because aspirin is, an, is a very nice antioxidant, cheap. And I also know then I learned that in South America, it's custom to spray salad bars with aspirin solution. So this was very interesting and you could not have found that out with the UAS, without the UAS score. And I can imagine, I don't know if it's used in, in India, but I can imagine that um, it's cheap as an antioxidant that some restaurants simply say, hey, it's easy, spray it over the salad bar and, and everything looks green and nice. Right, interesting story. Well, uh, next time we'll be aware. Uh, we need to find out from the uh, our uh, kitchen, uh, this thing from the, whether they're using this thing, but obviously there are, in fact, many preservative dyes, chemicals are being used to give the color to the thing. So many times we tell the patient not to use red, orange, green colored food, which you get from outside from the street food, uh, Chinese bale and all is very, very popular in India. So we always tell the patient to avoid this outside artificially colored food, which could be triggerant uh, due to the uh, colorants in it. So that is important. Obviously, it's a good story and we must understand. So truly, you have to be really uh, find out the true detective to find out the cause of urticaria. Uh, Dr. Abhishek, uh, well, we uh, have got patients of urticaria. They do not respond to four-step. Obviously, the omarizumab is the choice and the cyclosporine. But what are your other favorite apart from omarizumab and cyclosporine? Uh, most of my patients I give omalizumab and given that omalizumab now is available in India in the biosimilar form, the cost has almost gone one third of the original molecule. So it has it's become increasingly easy for us to omalizumab use these days. Um, and cyclosporine is other drug which we, I use. Uh, I have tried autologous serum therapy in uh, many of my patients, especially when I am in or practicing my medical college because so there I have infrastructure. So uh, we try autologous serum therapy. I have given hydroxygen in some patients who are like, you know, cannot afford omalizumab or cyclosporine. So in India, sometimes it can be difficult. Uh, there are other patients, like as you say, said, sir, I have tried H2 blockers also and methotrexis also. And methotrexism, 
I find it's not um, a very good drug for our articaria, but some of the patients respond well, and especially in children. I mean, uh, some of the children so where cyclosporin I have already given for three to four months, and I do not have too many drugs to uh, shift the patient to. Uh, then metotrexid can be a good choice of drug. Yeah, right. Thanks. May I comment, uh, Kiran? Yeah, I think yeah, this is very nice what Avishek just uh, just um, told us. Uh, we should also be brave and try ways, but then we should also try to publish if successful. And also, what what you pointed out, um, we have to acknowledge not only in Odigari and all over in, in medicine and dermatology, individual response. Um, this is a real problem of clinical trials. We always look at the average response. We don't look at responders and then reinvestigate the drugs. And I think we would have a much better understanding of medicine if we looked uh, at, at individual responders. So I think, can only say, please, please be active, try out, but publish. And yes. that's well, what you care is also good for the Gala network. Right, right. You rely on evidence and then the experience both come handy who treat uh, the thing. Uh, yeah, we have almost 40 minutes of discussion. So we have just last few minutes of uh, the, uh, the discussion. Uh, Dr. Janki, the last question uh, for you. You have seen articular treatment evolving from the older antihistaminics to newer antihistaminics. So what do you see the quality of life and the control of articular in last 40 years? Definitely there is a remarkable changeover. Uh, 96 or 2000, I should say, when we shifted from first generation to second generation, because uh, those days, uh, uh, phenyramine malleate and all the older antihistamine, the patients uh, complained uh, drowsiness, senior individuals, we are very much afraid of uh, retention of urine, glaucoma and all the other side effects. Uh, so there is definitely a, a dramatic change of events and uh, I mean, I can just say 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, uh, 2000 onwards, uh, management of urticaria with the second generation antihistamine is a big, big forward step. And uh, abducing the antihistamine is another big step. As I told you in the very beginning, I am very comfortable with second generation. Very, very rarely I use uh, sedating antihistamines that do not urticaria. Urticaria associated with other disorders, probably I may prefer at night. But for that, I am very comfortable with non-sedating antihistamine. I am very comfortable with uh, doubling the dose or tripling. Of course, I have never gone fourfold at all. Most of the time, I manage a triple. And uh, as again, Mukesh rightly, said three months down the line you make it into two three months down the line we make it into one gradually and most important of all these things we have to tell the patient none of the second generation antihistamines are steroids because with all of our counseling they will ask madam is it safe to take this much of bilastin daily for so many months and we have to tell them nothing will happen, nothing will happen. And repeatedly, we have to tell it is not a harmful drug. Definitely, there is a big, big change of practice from 70s to 2000 to 2020. And another big plus point, we have so many available options. Even for doubling the dose, tripling the dose, we have so many available options. So that is an added advantage. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yanki. We are last two minutes. I understand we have got other commitments. Dr. Zubar, my last question about the food allergy. We just got it from the chat. Uh, the, the patient, they use food allergy panel in urticaria. And then uh, the doctor is asking whether uh, should I, uh, can we uh, uh, can we decide about the food allergy panel and the elimination diet? So you are take yeah. on this. Uh, thank you, Kiran. And, and um, actually, it's very simple. Number one, um, if you have a patient history of real food allergy, that means eating something, having symptoms like vomiting immediately afterwards, this is important to look into. And skin prick testing, for instance, is valuable. But very often, this is a comorbidity. It's not the cause for urticaria. Whereas what I said pseudo allergies and like you said also for the street food in India where there are often preservatives and antioxidants used is often a cause for chronic spontaneous urticaria. But this 
doesn't have any testing. You have to use an elimination diet, but you have to use it for 14 days. And I think this is the, the most relevant message here. But the second message, which is relevant, there are comorbidities very often to urticaria, allergic rhinitis, atopic dermatitis, itchiness of the skin. And it's good if we can use like a drug with bilastine, which has also effects on these diseases to explain it to the patient that you have synergistic effects, which makes it even more important for the patient to take it. And like Mukesh pointed out, um, the most important is talk to the patient, give trust to the patient. People are afraid of drugs. You don't have to be afraid. There's not a single, code, single case worldwide of a long-term side effect with a drug like Bilastine. And this is comforting. We should tell that to our patients. And, uh, and then there was another question, my experience with omalizumab compared to the biosimilar, there is no biosimilar on the market to omalizumab for me available. So I can't say anything about that. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting yeah. discussion. Uh, biosimilar is also available in India and obviously the original is original. Biosimilar we need to test and really no head-to-head -head studies. Yeah, Dr. Mukesh, last words from you, then we'll be closing this session. Okay. Uh, first of all, I, I, I have been enriched a lot today, uh, listening to uh, Dr. Zubarviar, ma'am, Janki, ma'am, clinical experience, our exuberant uh, Abhishek. Uh, we all keep learning in the management of urticaria. We keep getting wiser with all the, with the subsequent interactions all the time. And for that, I, I must thank the charity team as a whole also, because you have always been with us uh, in uh, you know taking urticaria forward uh, so far as the management part of urticaria is concerned. So that is all I will want to say, sir. I want to leave now. Thank you. Thank you very much for interesting this thing. Bye-bye from all of you. But please stay tuned. We have got interesting cases by Dr. Abhishek Day. He'll be sharing some interesting cases and from that we have got some learning points. So Dr. Abhishek, please uh, go ahead with your presentation. And bye-bye for here, Dr. Torsten. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. It was quite, uh, quite an awesome experience. A lot of learning points, a lot of new take-home messages. Let's see. Uh, and uh, we'll uh, now discuss about certain cases um, which comes to our day-to-day -day clinic all of them are real cases and see how we should be uh, with all those knowledges given by our wonderful panelists and uh, and the faculty how we can uh, how can we can approach those patients so here is the comes of fast patients uh, which is an each which just doesn't uh, go now this is a 52 years old male uh, patient uh, presents with EG evanescent rashes for nine months now, the, his, there are history of few episodes of soiling up lips and face with no difficulty in breathing. Uh, there's no history of aggravating or relieving factors. No history of unknown um, known allergy to food or drugs. So, uh, of course, we find this uh, rash is quite common in our practice. Now, what happens to this patient when you do, do take the history? There's no history of inducibility. That's some part we need to know. There is already few visit uh, this patient has to pay to the emergency department in the past few months the patient also suffers from a known case of hypertension uh, since the past seven years on irregular treatment and when you do a, a test of uh, blood pressure in the clinic then uh, then we couldn't find out uh, we couldn't find out uh, that the patient's uh, blood pressure is not good uh, not oil control. So every single visit, we are finding that sometimes the patient uh, blood pressure is high, sometimes the blood pressure is low. So the patient usually forgets to take the antihypertensin medicines and it's uh, it's, it's a, not a good thing to do. Um, we Patient already has taken treatment for uh, articaria. Patient has taken hydroxygen, levocetogen, methylprednisolones uh, okay, a couple of times, Montelukast. Uh, patient has been given injection hydroxygen at least three times during this course of the uh, disease. We did a uh, test for dermographism, which is present. We did a test for pressure, ice cube, and vibration, where we found no reactivity. As we mentioned, that articaria activity seven score and articaria control test uh, had to be done, and we found that the patient had quite high UH7 score and UCT, so the disease is quite un, 
unconscious in spite of the patient taking on and off uh, antihistamine. So provisional diagnosis is pretty easy. So it was a case of chronic spontaneous cardiac arrhythmia from now. The discussion, you already know that. But the issue is, what are the laboratory investigation I usually send to those patients? When the patient is a chronic spontaneous CDK, I go for a uh, complete um, blood count, which includes uh, five part analyzing. We need to take this absolute basophil count and absolute eosinophil uh, counts in, uh, into our practice. Then we also, I also go for a CRP test, um, which are both are in this particular patient, which is normal. Uh, I did for it go for a TSH uh, just to find out there's an associated thyroid disease or not. Uh, yes, the hyper, there's a, some elevation of TSH is 5.5. anti tb antibodies were within normal limit and IgE was pretty high in this patient. So these are the lab pictures uh, for that patient. And this is the routine panel I usually go for my patients of chronic spontaneous urticaria. I also did an autologous serum skin test, which came out to be positive. So how do you manage this test, I mean, these cases? So we have already uh, know that when the patient comes with urticaria, we have to updose our antihistamine. And in this patient also, I have given a fourfold elevation of second generation antihistamines. There are some response, but as you can see, the response is not good enough. The US 7 score was still holding for 14 to 22 uh, in the last one and a half months we have treated the patients. So what could be a uh, next line? And next line of treatment, as we already know, that should be omalizumab. We offered the patient for omalizumab. The patient couldn't uh, afford that because it was expensive that only omalizumab available at that point of time was the international brand, and which is quite expensive for many of our patients. And the patient didn't have any uh, advantage of having um, uh, some you know, insurance. So we tried for nine injections of subcutaneous autologous serum therapy at weekly interval, and the condition actually didn't uh, help in uh, AST, and this actually condition worsened after the treatment. So what could be our next line of treatment? So you may think about cyclosporine, but as you say, that patient has come to us repeatedly and we found the patient blood pressure is irregular, patient doesn't take anti hyperdermis seriously. So it was not a very good patient for cyclosporine. If you saw the, uh, see the guidelines, this was the guidelines. Uh, as a second line of treatment, we should be given fourfold elevation of second generation antihistamine. We can uh, uh, give an omalism after that if it doesn't respond in cyclosporine. So many of these options are not uh, there for us because omalism the patient couldn't afford. Then if you see, there are other guidelines which also on almost on the similar line, uh, we tried fast generation antihistamine. This patient didn't give much of a response. Um, so we have this Indian guidelines where we have certain other drugs like we already mentioned about autologous serum therapy, which didn't work on the patient. Metotrexate can could have also been tried. However, one thing happened well, the patient was autologous on the autologous serum therapy. The omalizumab, uh, omalizumab was there as a biosimilar form, which is uh, quite inexpensive in compared to the original patent bank. The patient was given again options of omalizumab. And in this kind of patients where are in high Ig, otherwise refractory, omalizumab is possibly still remains the drug of choice. Now moving to the second case. Uh, this is a patient boy who loves to go to the gym, but always have some problem uh, arising when he do heavy exercises. It's a 22 year old male who complains of itchy wheels, as you can see from the photograph after physical exertion, uh, walking in the sun, eating spicy food, and when he is angry. A photograph taken by the patient uh, uh, showed that monomorphic pin uh, point wheels. Patient also is a known case of bronchial asthma. So what is your diagnosis? And diagnosis is pretty straightforward. We know the patient has, is cholinergic urticaria, and many patients of cholinergic urticaria uh, of course, we can uh, diagnose very easily by the clinical monomorphic pattern and also the history which the patient gives with the aggravation with heavy exercises or sweating. Uh, that is quite uh, obvious. But we also need to know that many of the patients of cholinergic urticaria also have associated atopic diseases. So what are the investigations should be done? We can do certain provocation tests either by using it uh, exercise like you know treadmill test or stationary bicycle test, or also can be uh, can ask the patient to take a hot bath at 42 degrees centigrade for 15 minutes. 
there can be other tests done like intradermal injection of acetylcholine or methacholine which can produce satellite wheels as you can see from the photographs now how to treat cholinergic urticaria now here we need to say that as far as the standard guidelines all urticaria guidelines part say that uh, whether it is a chronic spontaneous urticaria or chronic inducible urticaria the guidelines algorithm doesn't change we still need to use our uh, antihistamines four pole and after that it doesn't respond we good, uh, can go to omalizuma or cyclosporin there is a uh, guideline which published for cholinergic urticaria the it's not very different from uh, the standard urticaria management how are they divided into cholinergic urticaria with normal sweat function and hypoidotic cholinergic urticaria as you can see from here in hypoidotic cholinergic urticaria there are more chance we need a you know steroid pulse therapy on those patient in case of cholinergic urticaria normal sweat function usually the standard line of treatment should be good enough there can be some alternative uh, treatment like we can add h2 blockers we can give propranolol which sometimes uh, works we can give montelukast there have been suggestion of giving botulinum toxins uh, that has been uh, given high doses of danaz also all those things can be given very commonly done things in india is a topical application of keratolytic agents it's supposed to be uh, uh, effective especially the patients in hypohydrotic cholinergic urticaria now another case here the will uh, which comes and lasts for long period of time now this is a patient who's a 54 year old female patient patient has a two year is to a two year history of articular skin eruptions lasting for up to a week at a time and resolving uh, leaving either a bruising or a, a brown pigmentation on the skin now two things comes out from the picture first normal articular wheels doesn't last more than uh more than one day so that is something uh, is unusual about that and articular wheels usually uh, resolve without any trace of pigmentation however in this patient there's like bruised like or brown like pigmentation was there inside a patient's uh, skin patient also had additionally inflammatory polyarthritis that uh, from his past investigation we came to know that patient has some positive serologies like patient rheumatoid factors are weakly positive and patient also has a strongly positive anti nuclear antibody if you see the uh, patient has significant uh, uh, discrete and conflict articular plaques and then articular plaques actually results in dusky pigmentations and uh, they measure from 2 to 4 cm so that can be there in a uh, normal wheels but this dusky pigmentation resolution uh, delayed resolution is not seen in normal articular wheels so what could have been our diagnosis as you rightly uh, think it's a case of articular vasculitis that was our our uh, uh, differential diagnosis also so what do you do we did investigate a patient with a biopsy and the biopsy reveals in histoparietal superficial and deep perivascular interstitial polymer for nuclear infiltrate with nuclear dust leukocytoclasis and also the rbc extravasation and so this is classical leukocytoclasis uh, vasculitis uh, presentation like small vessel vasculitis presentation which we found from the histopathology and in direct immunofluorescence igm iga and c3 are uh, seen deposited around the blood vessels so uh, we did some additional investigation patient's complement levels came low uh, which is consistent with the hypocomplementemia Further serology uh, reveals uh, uh, SSA antibody positivity, ribonucleic uh, protein antibody positivity, and also anti-Smith antibody positivity. Her urine analysis was normal. So, with all these reports, sorry, it's kind of getting stuck. We came to our final diagnosis that is, this patient has a hypocomplementic uh, vasculitis, and we sent the patient uh, to rheumatology, and finally the diagnosis was made of SLE. so this something we need to know all the patients of articaria like lesion may not be articaria we need to keep our differential diagnosis in place there can be patients with bullous pemphigus got like lesion which presents like articaria there can be patient who like you know lepromatous hansen which can present like articaria and of course articular vasculitis sle these are the differential diagnosis we need to keep in our mind so how to differentiate between the classical articaria and articular vasculitis Uh, as far as articular vascular uh, lesions are painful 
in case of classical article it is more itchy the lesions persists more than 24 hours in case of article vasculitis also they leave some dusky pigmentation after resolve, uh, resolution of the lesions which is not seen in case of articaria there can be angioedema present with classical articaria it can be present also in article vasculitis but in case of article vasculitis purpura can be present which is not seen in classical articaria lesions uh, not much specific uh, laboratory findings can be found in articaria However, hypocomplementia can be associated with articular vasculitis. Of course, we need to do a skin biopsy. These are the very important indication for skin biopsy in patients of hives, which is persisting more than 24 hours. We can see a perivascular reaction in case of classic uh, articaria. In case of uh, articular vasculitis, we can find um, uh, features of leukocytoclastic vasculitis. Also, we can find direct immunosuppression positivity. So this is how we should be. Um, finding out if there are our patients uh, are, is articular vasculitis or articaria however suspicion is the key if the lesion stays more than 24 hours if uh, there is a uh, residual pigmentation always do a biopsy and that is the message from this cases thank you but abhishek uh, for that uh, wonderful uh, presentation on different cases so typically we have uh, uh, seen that articaria mimickers are many and one of the mimickers is a vasculitis which we all know and obviously the lesion lasting more than 24 hours is the key so patient can always take the photograph and uh, uh, this, uh, they can tell us uh, and obviously physical articaria is one thing which uh, we have not discussed but well physical articaria is one patient can tell you that well this is the, my cause this is how it looks and many times patient understands the disease and it tries to avoid the triggers uh, like heat, cold, pressure. Uh, yeah, that is uh, the thing about uh, the articaria. Uh, yeah, there's one more thing, case you discuss is about the uh, failure of autoserum therapy and of omarizumab. Uh, well, in India, we have a biosimilar of omarizumab is also available. For those who can't afford, you can always give them because that is the most preferred therapy because in COVID times, when the immunosuppression is a problem, omarizumab is not immunosuppressant. You can safely give it to the patients. You need not worry, whereas in cyclosporin, if you go beyond in a COVID endemic area where there is a high uh, uh, patient load, uh, you have to be aware that you can't give cyclosporin more than 1 to 2 mg per kg because of the immunosuppression. So that's why omarizumab is preferred. Obviously, the cost is a factor, but those who got really high Ig as this patient... Uh, the omarizumab would have been the choice. In fact, omarizumab should have been the choice for almost all of our patients when your fourfold do not work. So that is the message we have. Uh, well, we have uh, still uh, three to five minutes uh, uh, for the thing uh, about the cases. Dr. Abhishek, just last one or two questions about uh, your uh, patients. Uh, there is one question which I didn't take is, uh, have you found a difference between the original and... Uh, uh, biosimilar of omarizumab. Uh, are there any differences? We have not done uh, a study as such. I have not done any study as such. I'm, uh, I have only done, I've given five or six patients the new omarizumab. I had already given a 68 patients of older omarizumab. That data is getting published now, uh, as you are also part of that uh, phase four study. Sir, um, uh, I am a little circumspect about the new uh, uh, omalizumab. I'm not yet very convinced about the molecule. However, the price is very low. So that's very low compared to the original molecule. And the original number is mostly becoming unavailable also. It's very difficult now to get the original molecule. So I'm getting forced to use the omalizumab, uh, this uh, biosimilar omalizumab. I have given a couple of patients where the patient has not responded to 300 milligram omalizumab of this biosimilar. I have given 450 and then the patient responded. Uh, in case of original molecule, I hardly had to get to 450 milligram. That's the only uh, observation I can say for the timing, but I must say the data is very small. Only seven patients have given till now. So I, I need to get gather more experiences. Right, right. Time will tell us how it is. Obviously, the original is preferred, but it is actually beyond reach of common man. So you can try a biosimilar, which is uh, available. Uh, this was one question uh, which uh, was asked. And other question which uh, one doctor has asked about the skin allergy uh, blood test. Now, remember, none of the guidelines recommend that you do skin allergy test in all your patients. The Fadiatop assay or immunocap assay do not give you any clue. 
just sensitization is possible, but if, if it is to be a cause, it has to be in substantial level, more than 20 IU per ml. Uh, that should be the reading of your immunocap assay and which rarely happens. So don't go for those uh, food allergy tests or skin prick tests routinely in your articular patients. They may have some role in allergic rhinitis and allergic asthma, but not in urticaria or atopic dermatitis. So don't go and waste 5 to 1000 rupees on that. Instead of that, he can take a umarizumab injection to control because this uh, test will give you so many things positive, but that is not the cause. So that is one more uh, thing which I thought I'd like to tell you. So just uh, summarizing, we have a very interesting discussion. We are at first a good presentation by Dr. Torsten Zuberbayer about the new management guidelines and uh, the new algorithm, which will get published soon. Then we have got a healthy panel discussion on the tools and tricks of dermatology, and then the question answer from the patients, which are interesting. And then Dr. Abhishek uh, presented interesting cases. All in all, it was a wholesome experience, lot of learning from all of you. And I must thank Menarini for uh, getting this happen uh, to get the international speaker and talk to us and know the best from the global uh, team. With this, thank you very much. I hand it over to Menarini for the closing remarks. Thank you very much. Oh, Dr. Kiran, thank you very much. I mean, it was a very engaging webinar and discussion among you know all the doctors. And I thank Dr. Janki, Dr. Abhishek Day, Dr. Mukesh, uh, who had to leave a little early, and also Dr. Torsten. In fact, you know, all doctors were looking forward to hear to Dr. Torsten. And uh, as you know, this was the second uh, you know webinar on the subject, and we have one more planned on 22nd of August when we have Dr. Church. Uh, another international speaker who will be, you know, talking on the, uh, you know, on the topic. So uh, we have doctors who have joined from all parts of the country. And I thank everyone because nowadays Sunday is a normal day. I mean, people like to go around. Still, you know, we have so many people who have joined us for this webinar that clearly shows that the thirst for knowledge and the update is uh, very high among the doctors. What this, what, one thing I also want to point out is that the uh, original uh, black strain, what we are selling in India is same what is manufactured across the world. It's manufactured in Italy only. The same thing we are getting here, but not at a Mercedes price, but at an Indian price. So that is a good thing. You know, our price would be uh, roughly 10, 15% higher than the next price. I mean, it's not exorbitantly priced. It is priced uh, within the reach of, I think it's 17 rupees or something per tablet, 16 or 17 rupees. So it is very well in the reach of the patient. It is not like Omizumab and other, you know, originators because uh, Menorini uh, always thinks about the ex patient access should be important because if the patient cannot afford, I mean, then any drug is of no use. So looking into this, we have made the product available across the country. And I'm sure, you know, many times doctors have told us that, the literature is very good, but the results are not good, whatever they have tried. But I am sure because the literature was, the trials was done on the original, not on the local generics. So once you start using the original, you will get the same results. So with that closing remark, I will thank you once again, sir. And it has been, a, it was a pleasure, uh, you know, and I look forward for more engaging, uh, you know, meetings like this. And we are looking forward also for face-to-face -face meeting as soon as it happens. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you.